So there's some new testing coming out looking at zonulin and markers of intestinal permeability. Uh, where does that fit into this whole conversation? So intestinal permeability is massive. We encourage all of our patients who have any form of chronic disease or autoimmunity in that matter to get their gut looked at. And we often start there. And so intestinal permeability testing is one part of that, right? If we've got, gosh, you talk about inflammation. If we've got micropores and things are getting into our bloodstream, they're going to create inflammation. And they're also going to start to create all sorts of uh, secondary food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. you know, so if we can start to get that gut healing and intestinal permeability, it's just one of the gut tests we do, but it is a very powerful one. Hey friends, it's Mike with High Intensity Health. Thanks for tuning back into another episode. I'm very excited today to be with Dr. John Dempster. Today we're gonna to talk about autoimmunity and mental health disorders here, and we're in Toronto, Canada, beautiful clinic, so. Welcome, Mike, thanks, thanks for, for coming here. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we've had many conversations about skiing and functional medicine and all that, but a big part of your practice is helping people with autoimmune disease, approaching Absolutely. that more from the functional medicine perspective, and I think, that that's a great you know kind of mental framework to approach this seemingly complex disorder of autoimmunity. So maybe let's launch with why do so many people nowadays seemingly have these autoimmune disorders? Yeah, great question. And you know, first of all, I think we're seeing uh, a, a big growth of this because number one, we're getting better at diagnostics, and uh, yeah. this is you know there are over two hundred different autoimmune disorders that are uh, identified right now. Um, but we're, we're getting better at starting to do the more complex testing and the more uh, complex imaging. And that's really, it's been helpful for, for many cases in medicine, but especially with autoimmunity, a lot of people suffered in silence for so long they didn't know what they had. Um, you know, for example, hypothyroidism, right? And something we talked about off camera. This is something that more and more doctors are now screening for antibodies when their normal labs come back normal, right? Mm -hmm. Like TSH and T3 may be coming back normal that person's still feeling really crummy. And so now some of the functional medicine docs that are out there and, and more integrated minded docs are really doing that, uh, that next level testing that you can have those labs normal, but if you've got antibodies that are flagged, that means your thyroid is not normal at all. And that's just one example, but mm -hmm. there's so many different examples that we see at the clinic that people have been just unfortunately falling through the cracks in, in the regular healthcare system. And it takes a little bit more digging and a little bit more getting to know the patient and their history to, to really start to figure out what's, what their story is. It's, yeah. it's massive. You mentioned, or you brought up the, um, you know, the topic of autoimmune hypothyroidism. I think that is so pervasive. I feel like so many uh, like friends or friends and their, their spouse or you know, their sister or something have you know, Hashimoto's or mm -hmm. some you know, kind of iteration of that. Why is the thyroid so susceptible to becoming or creating antibodies and not creating antibodies. Why does the immune system create antibodies against the thyroid? That's yeah. There's lots of angles we can go here. Yeah. I think one of the biggest ones, especially when it comes to thyroid, is our exposure to toxins in our environment. And there's many different ways that we are exposed to toxins. There's exogenous sources, things that we're breathing in through the air, things that we're consuming through our food and drink. Uh, but there's also toxins that are being produced inside of our body, specifically our gut. And, and so right now, <clears throat> excuse me, we're seeing lots of exposure, and this is something that's not just happening in our generation, it's happened in our parents' generations, it's happened in our grandparents' generations. And that brings, in, and that's the reason why I smile, is that brings this whole other conversation of something called epigenetics, right? And we can go into many different directions here. But we're seeing this accumulation of toxicity and this impact that it has on our genes and now we're, you know, suddenly it's, it's the straw that literally breaks the camel's back. And many, I have colleagues of mine who are in the medical field right now who are being diagnosed with thyroid cancer, with uh, obviously Hashimoto's. Um, and they're living very, very healthy lives. So this isn't necessarily something that they've done or something they've necessarily exposed themselves to. This is where it really starts to support this uh, theory and this uh, uh, science of epigenetics, which I find fascinating, mm -hmm. and you know we can we can kind of go down that tangent if you want to, but I really think it's the toxicity right now that is the number one trigger. There are lots of underlying factors, but it's the number one trigger for a lot of the the hypothyroid and the Hashimoto's cases that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So it's this developmental epigenetic kind of this transgenerational. So maybe our, our parents or our grandparents were exposed to things like in the 50s and 60s DDT and, and other toxins that were. 
right. you know, spray it around without any regulation or testing, and then so their immune system and their neurologic system, et cetera, or gut health is altered via this, this these epigenetic shifts. So maybe for folks that don't know what the epigenome is, I think it'd be good to define that. Well, we're all dealt a deck of cards, so to, so to speak, right? We're all dealt our, our genes. Now, what we've learned in the, in the epigenetic realm, and these are with the minds of, you know, Dr. Jeff Bland. He's one of the, you know, the leading, uh, who you know well, um, leading brilliant minds in this space, is that genes are now almost like light switches. We can't change that deck of cards, but we can actually take a card and we can turn it over. Or like a light switch, we can flip it on or flip it off. And those, the, the factors that can can trigger those uh, actions are going to be things that are happening in our environment, are going to be our thoughts and our emotions, are going to be the foods that we're eating, are going to be the microbes that are in our gut. These are the types of things that we're starting to look at as functional medicine doctors and practitioners because this is so important to create that environment of, of optimal health, uh, whether you're dealing with autoimmune disorder or mental health challenges or cancer or heart disease, whatever it may be. We know that these are factors, and we've really got to start to treat the person. We can't treat the label anymore. Mm -hmm. Very important point. There's some new testing that looks at epigenetic expressions like mRNA and, and other um, methylated genome sequences. Do you look at that in your clinical practice at all? Or? Well, unfortunately, I'm in a province right now where we're restricted on that testing. It doesn't mean that we aren't uh, looking at it, so to speak, but our patients uh, have to, to actually get that testing done on their own, and that's mm -hmm. something that we're hoping that will change soon. Uh, I, have, I have a lot of training in that area, and we were doing that for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, but right now, it's just a technicality in, our cert in Ontario that we can't actually do that testing, but a lot of patients out there can actually access this on their own, and I encourage them to do so. Uh, and then take it to a doctor who is fluent in this, no matter where, where you live. Uh, but it is such an important thing, Mike, and I hope that that changes in Ontario pretty soon. Yeah, that's awesome. So I definitely want to circle back to Hashimoto's, but kind of finish out this epigenetics conversation. How malleable um, is our epigenome? Because we, we hear a lot about this epigenomic imprinting, like, you know, when we're in the womb, in the first couple of years of life, and if you're exposed to trauma or famine, you know, when you're a child, that may affect your predisposition to obesity. How malleable is this kind of these strings that regulate our gene expression? So a couple of things. I think, first of all, if you have a, a big familial history of a certain illness or a certain condition, you're not guaranteed that you're going to go down that road. Yeah. All right? There's a lot of things that you can do, and you can take the power back and you know, take your health uh, under your own control. And there are things that you can do to reduce your risk of these things. Um, we are still in the infancy, to be very honest, in the science of epigenetics. And I think we, you know, five, ten years from now, we're going to be uh, learn. We will have learned so much more that would be fascinating. I'm very excited to see where it goes. But right now, we do know that, uh, and I'm not sure if this is answering your question, but if you do have a strong familial tendency, you can take action to completely reduce your risk. That we do know. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens five years from now. Mm. Interesting. Um, I just want to throw in just a little personal side story about the ketogenic diet and want to get your perspective on that. One thing that has attracted me to this particular diet is the main metabolite, beta-hydroxybutyrate, when you're in ketosis, is a powerful epigenetic modulator and affects DNA expression and genome stability and all that sort of stuff. Um, how, and then kind of weaving this back into autoimmunity, any thoughts or experience clinically with ketosis in your patients? Yeah, and this is, I think, at the end of the day, we should always be customizing a diet to each person. But I, ask, I get asked the question all the time, what is the best diet for everybody? And I say, look, if we had to pick one, it would be something blending into some form of a ketogenic diet. Anything we can do you know, to, to put our body into ketosis is going to help on all levels of inflammation. It's going to help all levels of insulin control. Uh, there's so many angles that are going to be affected by going on a ketogenic-based diet. Uh, and yes, you can do it vegan, by the way. It's tougher, but it is possible. Uh, one of my good friends, Dr. David Jockers, is showing some awesome work in this right now. But yeah. it, is, uh, it is a good thing for a lot of people. At the end of the day, I say treat the person. Yeah. You've always got to come back to that. Right, right. Um, well, so there's some speculation on the internet about the ketogenic diet and causing uh, thyroid issues and affecting like free T3 and all that. Right. And, you know, if you have adrenal fatigue and blood sugar imbalances that maybe this shouldn't, wouldn't be good for you. Where do you stand with that, with low carb in general and those, you know, HPA axis yeah, dysfunction? Again, you know, what we do in our clinic is we do a lot of testing with our patients so that we can really customize that program. We're measuring nutrients. Mm -hmm. We're finding out where they're deficient. We're looking at all the hormones beyond just thyroid hormones that impact the thyroid function. We're looking at their adrenals. We're looking at all their steroid hormones, all their sex hormones. 
we're looking at how heavy metals are influencing their, their endocrine dis, um, system in their body. Um, so I think it's really important, once again, Mike, is to customize it, you know, and if you see somebody not doing well, then you've got to come back to the drawing boards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's a good thing to start with, but sometimes you do have to tweak it. Yeah. And I have seen that clinically. Right. Brilliant. Um, so let's go back to some of the advanced testing. So someone doesn't feel well, like mm -hmm. they just feel tired, but their quote unquote lab tests are normal, which is pretty common. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned like looking at antibodies and other things. What are some other traditional and maybe non-traditional autoimmune biomarkers that we can look at and say, you know what, your immune system is kind of losing tolerance. Something is developing here. Sure. Every one of our patients gets a core set of blood labs done on their first visit. And depending on what their condition is, I will still tweak that. Um, but when we are looking at the thyroid, we're actually looking at seven thyroid tests, like specifically to the thyroid. Not, I'm not talking about the indirect tests. I'm talking about seven blood labs, okay? So you've got your free T3, your free T4, your TSH, but then you've got your anti-TPO, you've got your anti-thyroid globulin, your, your reverse T3, and then your TSI. So these are the seven that we actually do when we suspect that there's a thyroid issue. Now, the thyroid still may not be the problem. If somebody comes to my clinic and they're tired, we may be talking about as, as you touched on earlier, nutrient deficiencies. We may be talking about all sorts of other neuroendocrine disruptions. Um, I've had people be tired because of one food that they were eating their diet, and that was a healthy food, by the wow. way. And it was just creating enough of an inflammatory cascade that it was weighing them down. It's almost like the, leaving the car, slightly, the car door slightly ajar overnight. You try to start your car battery the next day. It just wasn't enough juice to, to get that uh, started. Um, but there's so many areas that we look at. We start to really spend a lot of time, as I touched on, is about the toxicity. Mm -hmm. And that's massive. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, toxic metals. Uh, we do a lot of work with foods, food sensitivities, food intolerances. And we really spend a huge amount of time with any suspected autoimmune condition with the gut. Mm -hmm. And there's so many specific labs out there, guys. If, you're, if your doctor is not looking into the gut as to some form of uh, treatment and diagnostic for you, if, if there's autoimmunity suggested, you've got to find somebody who's going to. We've got to talk about intestinal permeability. We've got to talk about dysbiosis. We've got to talk about inflammation. And there are wonderful labs out there that you can have access to if you're working with the right doc. Brilliant. Uh, you brought metals again and toxins, which I think is, is worth talking about, like the elimination mm -hmm. strategies. Uh, obviously, you know, a big thing is avoidance, like minimize your exposure to, you know, uh, you know, bad air, for example. You know, if you run near a freeway, probably not a good idea. Get an mm -hmm. air filter. Um, what are your top avoidance strategies? And then how do you deal with these metals? Because some people just have high levels of cadmium arsenic and then is jumping into chelation right for them? Like, Yeah, great uh, question. No, yeah. it's not right for everybody. And uh, nor is it necessary. First of all, a little backstory, I come from three generations of dentists, and so we've had this conversation at our dinner table for a long time, um, and I've been very fortunate. My father's been taking uh, metal fillings out of people's mouths for over 40 years now, so I've learned a lot about both sides of uh, the pros and cons of this, and also, more importantly, how to do it properly. So dental exposure is massive. Industrial exposure is massive. Food exposure is massive. You know, the fish that we're eating right now, the seafood. We've got to be very careful. Fish, it's a beautiful fish and seafood are very healthy for the most part. But unfortunately, we're starting to see that that may have been healthy in the past and it may not be as healthy now as we once thought. Um, we've got to look at what the paint we're putting on our walls. We've got to look at the exposure that we've got um, inside with our air quality, right? These are massive things that we start to touch on. And it's not just about removing the metals. And you know, I'm sure you've touched on this with other interviews. People who have lots of gut issues, such as yeast overgrowth or mold in their house, these, these people have a harder time removing metals from their body, from what we've seen, mm -hmm. uh, the yeast exposure particularly. So there's so many, like if somebody comes to me and, they, and we do a lab test that finds that they have high mercury, we don't just rush at starting to strip the mercury out of the body. We have to make sure that all of their monkeries are working well. We have to make sure that all their other elimination pathways are working well. Uh, because the worst thing you can do is put somebody on a chelation program blindly because they can end up multiple times sicker than, than when you got them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I caution people, when you are talking about heavy metal removal, make sure you are working with somebody who is very trained and very experienced in that area. Yeah. So it's almost like mercury is like the symptom, right? Meaning that there's other issues going on and that's like the canary and the, you know, you have to address kind of... 
Yeah, and it can be the main factor for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But you're right; it could be the tipping point, and it could it could just be one part of it. And you know, it's like pulling the thread on the sweater. Yeah. Uh, you just you want to be very careful there. You don't want to just start lunging at the symptom. That's not what we do as functional medicine doctors. We get to our our goal and our objective is to get to the root of the problem, mm -hmm. not to just put a bandaid on it. Right. 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 So your father, he's, is he a biological dentist? He is. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And so, so you can naturally converse. Did that help get you into naturopathic medicine as well? And Indirectly, yeah. My mm -hmm. parents, uh, and I always joke in, in, in other interviews, I say, look, I was that kid in, in uh, public school and high school that wasn't allowed to go to school until he had a shot of cod liver oil in the morning, which we now know is mercury. No, yeah. just kidding. <laughs> uh, good quality ones do not, guys. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I was that kid that had to have that shot of cod liver oil. And as soon as I got home, I had to have that glass of carrot juice before dinner. Awesome. And so I was, you know, you're in agony as a kid, like, oh, do we have to? Do we have to? Um, and then, you know, as you start to get into high school and get into university, you're seeing and learning why this may have been a good idea. So mm -hmm. it wasn't just my dad, it was my parents' influence and my grandfather, actually. Uh, he was another big influence of mine. He's, you know, a European engineer. He's 92 right now. He just retired two years ago. Wow. And um, 40 years ago, he was told he was going to have a double hip repla replacement. And um, he said, no, very stoic, you know, European. Uh, and he hit the books. This is pre-internet. And he found out that he was reacting to foods and this was creating a lot of the osteoarthritis that he was having a severe uh, case of. He started to learn about tinctures and he started to learn about fish oils. Wow. And he reversed his osteoarthritis to the point where the surgeon said, would you please come in and meet with my group and, and you know, share, and share what, yeah. well, what happened here. That is incredible. So, yeah, I'm very fortunate. I had a, a lot of family uh, support and uh, I would say exposure to clinical nutrition, even though they weren't necessarily preaching it or teaching it right. uh, directly as a clinical nutritionist, right? Yeah, yeah, they were spearheading the, the trends before it was really popular. Yeah. So um, as a parent now looking back, right, so you went through this where your parents were trying to make you, you know, have, give you healthier items and things like that. Um, did you rebel against that at all at some point? Like, does that No, change? I think, you know, and I self-admittedly had a tough time eating fish as a kid, guy. <laughs> like, it, it was... Yeah. It was uh, to the point where my family made fun of me. So taking that shot of fish oil was a big deal for me, but I did it. I toughed it mm -hmm. out. Um, no, but I didn't rebel. I somehow knew that this was Good the right thing. And I always knew I was going to be a doctor. I just didn't know that this type of medicine existed growing sure. up. And it was literally up until my third year at pre-med that I decided to go into naturopathic medicine. So, right. um, yeah, I think this is part of my calling, part of my journey. So. Yeah. My wife and I talk about this with our daughter. We think that, like, oh my gosh, is she going to rebel? Because we are giving her juices and, and uh, you know, ferments, and you know, mm -hmm. we have chickens in the backyard. She has raw eggs and all that sort of stuff. Awesome. And it's like, at some point, is she going to rebel and start going to McDonald's? So I just wanted to get your perspective on that because, you know what? And and so what if she goes to McDonald's once in her life, right? Yeah. Or you know, occasionally I tell my patients it's not about perfection; it's about progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and I know my wife and I we have a young daughter, and, and we're you know very realistic, but we're also going to try and instill those those values with her, yeah. so that she can start to make those choices. But uh, at the end of the day, kids are kids, and uh, you know it's not always going to be perfect. And you know I always want to make sure that my daughter's health is number one. Uh, yeah. But I. I want to make sure that she grows up with a sense of reality too, and not to say that we're promoting anything like that. But uh, um, I think, and we'll experience it as we go. Right now, she's very good, and she's she's listening mm -hmm. to mommy and daddy. But uh, as you say, you know, there may be some influences coming down the road, right? Yeah, other kids' birthday parties, you'll have a trouble. Yes. With, yeah, <laughs> you know, because parents don't see the problem with purple and neon green cake. You know, totally. that's totally all yeah. food colorings and all that. So. And I think we'll we'll certainly do our best to steer her away from that. Yeah. All right, so we kind of got away from the topic, yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. Like, people will enjoy that conversation. Let's go back to food testing. You kind of that was tacitly mm -hmm. implied in in helping. You know, and you talked about your grandfather with gut health. Mm -hmm. uh, I I think a lot of people are confused. What does IgG food testing mean? What have mm -hmm. you found? You have a very busy practice. Thirty f people from thirty five different countries throughout the world come to see you. Mm -hmm. So, what have you found to be most consistent and reliable with food testing? Let me start off by saying there is no perfect food test. Um, that is something that, again, I would like to see continue to grow in terms of you know getting better and better uh, testing, um, you know, diagnostics available to our patients. But there is still, I find, a tremendous amount of benefit to start to investigate foods and how people react because there are different antibodies. And you touched on IgG. That's a delayed reaction, and that's one of many. But there are immediate reactions, and, and a lot of people, and a lot of people have had experience with their medical doctors with, you know, their allergy testing, um, which, you know, generally speaking, can be an IgE reaction. 
when we do testing with our patients, it's all case specific. And you know, sometimes I do have to do IgE testing, uh, but a lot of the times it's the foods that they can't figure out on their own or have not been diagnosed in the past uh, because not too many of their doctors have started to look in the sensitivity side of things. And IgG testing is, when it's done with a reputable lab, is accurate. And I always get that question, is this testing accurate? Mm -hmm. But it's not perfect, okay? It's accurate what you're measuring, but it's not a perfect test, right? There are false positives, there are false negatives. These are things that, as an experienced functional medicine doctor, you'll start to see patterns and you'll have to start to, uh, you have to do some interpretation still, but the testing is helpful uh, because some of these reactions are delayed by up to two weeks. Mm. And it's very hard for you and I to sit down in front of you know, our, our plate and say, okay, I'm gonna eat that broccoli right now. Oh, I feel fine in, you know, an hour from now, I feel fine tomorrow, that, therefore broccoli doesn't bug me. Mm. Well, in some cases it does bug people. And, and that's where we can really start to help people identify the triggers of these inflammatory agents uh, that play a huge role with autoimmunity. Mm. And, and that's what it's all about. It's about looking at inflammation. And if we can, you know, I know we'll probably dive down a road here on that, sure. but if we can help people by what they're putting into their body daily, identify the, the, their friends and their foe, that can really uh, kickstart their healing process for mm -hmm. sure. And can people get to a certain point, like for example, um, some of these tests come back and say that you're sensitive or allergic to turmeric, right? Or seemingly healthy foods, blueberries, rosemary, whatever it is, stuff that most nutritionists and health experts would agree you should be eating more of. Can we get to a place where their immune system is more tolerant or their gut microbiome is favorable that they can reincorporate these foods? Yes. And what symptoms should they be looking for that might be indicative of a... Yeah, I, and I think it's, it's tricky to know exactly the, the time to reintroduce those foods, and that's part of the art of the practice, is when you see somebody gaining steam and their symptoms are going down, whether it, you know, gosh, if we're talking about thyroid again, you know, if they're starting to pick up with their energy and their metabolism's engaging and their hair's growing back, um, this is time for us to start to readdress what they can start to eat again. And, and every single one of my patients, when we create that custom program to them and a lot of them you know at the beginning the toughest part is the first few weeks because they're cutting out foods that they've been very acclimated to over the years and and very used to uh, and so when they get through those first three weeks everything else becomes quite easy and they get so excited when we start to reintroduce foods yes we will uh, often retest and that can be depending on the case anywhere between six and twelve months uh, sometimes sooner but a lot of people, we can start to reintroduce some of those foods, especially, like you said, like turmeric, blueberries, foods that are healthy in many directions mm -hmm. that can provide a lot of benefit in many directions. Let's start to bring those back in and let's just watch their symptoms. And uh, um, it, it, they, get, they get very excited. That's awesome. So there's some new testing coming out looking at zonulin and markers of intestinal permeability. Uh, where does that fit into this whole conversation? So intestinal permeability is massive. And you know I would say virtually every almost every one, I have to say almost, because not everybody can fly over here every single time we need a test. But we encourage all of our patients who have any form of chronic disease or autoimmunity in that matter uh, to get their gut looked at. And we often start there. And so intestinal permeability testing is one part of that, right? If we've got, gosh, you talk about inflammation. If we've got micropores and things are getting into our bloodstream, they're going to create inflammation. And they're also going to start to create all sorts of uh, secondary food sensitivities mm -hmm. and so if we can start to get that gut healing and intestinal permeability it's just one of the gut tests we do but it is a very powerful one mm -hmm. and w when it comes to SIBO is that something that you look at mm -hmm. definitely so uh, again you know it's case specific right and if I have people who have uh, very specific cases that would warrant that testing we will do that we don't have a blanket testing package for our patients we do a lot of SIBO testing because we see a lot of gut issues um, we do a lot of CDSA testing, which is the stool analysis. And uh, you know, these are the things that we'll start to, to bring together so that everybody uh, can have a very customized roadmap or GPS, if you will, of what's going on in their body. Yeah, and have you found that SIBO really correlates with autoimmunity and, and inflammation? Yes and no. You know, mm -hmm. I find, you know, I'll start a large, anytime you've got a gut imbalance, I would say yes, yeah. right? And I think that's so important to address. Um, but SIBO, I still, you know, if I've got the, the constipation, if I've got the diarrhea, if I've got the bloating, mm -hmm. these are things that I'll still uh, I'll look at specifically. Um, I have other things that I would look at from an autoimmune case prior to SIBO, uh, mm -hmm. but it's case by case. I have some patients that come to me and they've done every testing but SIBO testing, so of mm -hmm. course we'll get that done right away. Um, but it, it is case by case, Mike, and uh, you know, sometimes you have to, you have to wear that, uh, 
that artist had uh, in, in the practice as well. Yeah. So if, if someone is fatigued and they think they have an autoimmune disorder and they've done all the traditional tests and they, cause some people just don't have access to a functional medicine doctor right. in their area or they live out in the boonies and so forth. And they, I get these questions all the time, like, uh, you know, what sort of tests, like if you could just say, okay, there's three things you can test and then maybe you can set up a virtual consult with someone. What three tests would you run if someone um, suspects they have, you know, gut inflammation, autoimmunity, they feel lethargic and tired, just not their self. Is there th kind of or four tests that you could recommend? Okay, so from a functional medicine perspective? Sure. Okay, so, you know, definitely, if, again, if we're suspecting Hashimoto's or some form of a thyroid issue, you've got to get the right blood done. And so that's the core blood work that we'll do. And, you know, oftentimes we can get our family doctors to help us with this. Um, the ones that start to know what I do here and, and um, you know, they're, they're becoming more open to it, yeah. if that's the way to describe it. Um, but even if not, get it done with your functional medicine dog. Make sure you're looking at all your organ function. This is all done in this one test. All of your major organs, your liver, your kidneys, your spleen, your pancreas. Make sure that you're looking at inflammatory markers. HSCRP is massive, okay? But then, as I mentioned earlier, get all of those seven thyroid tests done. That just kicks the ground off. Uh, and you're running at that point in the direction of a thyroid or at that point if it's not thyroid we're moving very quickly in a different direction. Mm -hmm. If somebody's tired and fatigued and lethargic as you say we're looking at a core hormone panel and one of the tests that we love is the Dutch test and it's a urine test uh, and yes you know it's tough to get this through your family doctor uh, generally uh, but again some of those that are practicing functional medicine may have access to that. Uh, this is the most comprehensive hormone test that's available. It's not only looking at hormones, it's looking at metabolites. And my patients will get seven pages of data back, which is very powerful. Yeah, the report's awesome on the test. That's great, and it's only going to get better. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then we've got our micronutrient analysis, which also can really be important when you're looking at 30 major nutrients uh, that don't often get picked up in a, in a traditional blood test. In a traditional serum blood test, we've got to go intracellular, mm -hmm. and, and and that can be also very helpful. And so that's a you know that's a big part of those are my top three uh, tests right out of the gates. And the fourth one, really case specific, but it's almost it's gut work, mm -hmm. right? And that's generally going to be starting with foods that impact the gut, which impacts the rest of the body. Um, but most cases, I'll, I'll encourage my patients to get a thorough gut analysis done. Awesome. So you mentioned the Dutch test, which I think is fantastic, and a lot of people are throwing around, um, and this has been pervasive in the functional medicine community, where alternative medicine is adrenal fatigue for a while. Mm -hmm. And we know that we've been talking about pathogens and toxins and so forth. Could this adrenal fatigue be like a compensation of the body to deal with the inflammation that's going on? Have you found that to be the case? Yeah, and I think we're moving, you know, I think we still largely call it adrenal fatigue, but I think there's going to be other definitions of this going yeah. forward. Um, so. Let's go back. What are adrenals? Adrenals are our stress glands, right? Well, what causes stress in our body? Of course, you know, we, we have you know, the typical stressors, work, life stress, but we've also got stressors that are happening unbeknownst to us, right? And if we're eating foods that are constantly creating that inflammatory cascade or we've got uh, imbalances of our microbiome, um, these are also creating, uh, you know, as I said, like the car door staying on overnight. That's a draw on our system and that can slowly suck up our energy reserves. So I th you've, you've got to come at it all ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, stress isn't always that mental, emotional stress when we're driving to work on a Monday morning, you know. Um, we've got to make sure that we're looking at things that are all around us in our environment and uh, in our lives. Mm -hmm. But we do know that, that that psychosocial stress can be a big factor. And, and so many people mm -hmm. are saying, I'm eating right, I'm doing yoga, I'm meditating, I'm getting eight hours of sleep, like I'm doing all that, but I haven't had a vacation in two years and, and yeah. you're going on vacation today. So um, how important, like have you ever just told a patient, like look, we need to just take a break, go on a vacation, okay. like unplug, like, I mean, it sounds so, I don't want to say woo woo, but it sounds so like too simple to actually make an impact. It's, it is simple. Uh, and sometimes we like to make our lives way more complex than they are. We just finished hosting our second mental wellness summit. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and we interviewed 30 of the, 32 of the brightest minds in that space. And, you know, we had Dr. Mark Hyman on there, JJ Virgin, gosh, uh, Dave Asprey, even, you know, people in the biohacking field, uh, uh, sector. So these are, there's so many people saying the same thing mm -hmm. is make sure that don't pride yourselves on being busy anymore. You know, like it's okay to work hard. But you've got to make sure that that's not your only purpose in life. Uh, I think a lot of us are, you know, especially I, I notice in in, uh, in Toronto, and uh, you know, we have a lot of people who are very driven individuals, which I love. 
I would say I might fall into that category. Yeah. But we've got to take that self-care back. Harvard University is doing a ton of research on this right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been very fortunate to do some work down there. And gosh, if they're telling people to do 10 deep breaths every hour, there's got to be something to it. Um, take a break. You know, yeah. Go on vacation. I find that when I go on vacation, I come back way more productive, way more efficient, and sometimes with a whole new set of clarity uh, that you know, helps me help my patients in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. um, it is important to take that time and we've got to start to learn to, to, that self-care is a priority. And whether it's a vacation, whether it's literally waking up in the morning and being grateful for three things, uh, you know, these are little small steps that you can start uh, if, if taking two weeks off work is, uh, is, is intimidating right now. Right. But I encourage everybody to, to make sure you start to look at what's going on with you and what's important to you. Spend time with your family. Spend yeah. time with your friends. You know, um, yeah, we could go on a long, a long segment down there, but I'll leave it at that for now, Mike. Yeah, I think that's a really good tip. And, and you mentioned like starting the day off with gratitude. When I take my daughter to school in the morning, we listen to this Karen Drucker song, and she has kind of a spirituality shtick. And when the song, the, all the lyrics are about gratitude and being thankful, thankful for this day. And then I notice it kind of comes back to mindset, which is where I would love to finish off with you. Mm -hmm. um, it, so I noticed my daughter, she's like, I'm so grateful for this. And she's saying, thank you more. And it's like, just That's amazing. Awesome. Like just these small little things, like even just, okay, if you, if you don't have the resources right now to take a vacation, you could do something in your car that could change that experience, which could affect your day, maybe make you more productive, make more money, take the vacation, whatever. Totally. So these subtle messages are key instead of listening to the news, which is all about North Korea is going to bomb us. And then there's, yeah. you know, shootings in Las Vegas. And Turn the news off. <laughs> you know, it's not about being ignorant, but it's about, yeah. you don't have to be inundated with negativity. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're just about to, as we were discussing earlier, we're just about to launch our online mental wellness tribe platform. Yeah. Uh, and this is something that's going to be a great resource to a lot of people because they're going to have these tools, these daily rituals that they can start to build in. They're going to have access to an online community that they can talk to people potentially dealing with similar situations. That is another area that we want to talk about is community, right? Yeah. You've got to be able to talk. You've got to be able to... Um, you got to be able to feel loved. You've got to be able to feel supported and um, and accepted. And so all of these areas that we're talking about today, even from the foods we eat all the way up to you know the mindfulness, this impacts our microbiome and this impacts us. Uh, whether we're dealing with hypothyroid disease or depression, everything in between. It's totally. so important. That's key. Um, for folks listening, a lot of people listen to this. Some people do watch. Obviously, uh, what are the links uh, for for the mental wellness summit and then also the tribe that you're talking about? I will forward them over to you. Yeah, I think it's the mentalwellnesstribe.com, and that's a great question. Uh, we're just uh, we're just in beta right now, but it is launching in the next month. Uh, but I think it's mentalwellnesstribe.com. Okay. Um, and our, our summit that just finished was mentalwellnesssummit2.com. Right. So we'll get you the link. The number two. The yep. number two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll put them in the show notes and also below this YouTube video as well. It's awesome. Which is fantastic. So you mentioned uh, like rituals and things like that, and we you have a busy practice. Your big avid skier, which is fantastic. We, that's how we started you know, mm -hmm. talking about these things. What does the first couple hours of your day look like? We know people really are protective of their time in the morning. So. Number one is I go and get my daughter. Uh, that's uh, daddy daughter time. I go and get her and uh, spend some time with her. Um, my wife and my daughter and I would do breakfast together. Um, if I'm lucky, sometimes my wife will do breakfast. I will run out, do, do my exercises, come back, and then finish up. But uh, I love to do to write down or say three things that I'm grateful for every day. Uh, I also have some affirmations that I do every single morning. And I make a point of it to walk to work every day. And again, I understand not everybody has the, the ability to do that. Um, and, but my point is, is get outside, mm -hmm. get active, and, and do something. Whether you're living, working, living and working in a, in a, in a tower, um, you know, these are things that you can still have access to being active and pop outside and get some air. Mm -hmm. I think those things are so important. One of my favorite things is vitamin N, vitamin nature, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, skiing is one of my outlets. I also do a lot of canoeing in the Arctic and a lot of fly fishing. And cool. these are things that uh, I'm very fortunate that, um, you know, I, being in Canada, we, we can just walk out our backyard ostensibly and, and have access to these things. But, you know, whatever it is to you, get outside and embrace embrace nature and that is something that I think we get away from in our busy lives in mm -hmm. our in our very tuck savvy lives too which I think is fantastic but we've got to have that balance that's key yeah and so many people that are trying to repair their health are, are taking a ton of supplements and obsessing about food and then they forget mm -hmm. about just like you said getting natural sunlight mm -hmm. exposure to the outdoors and there's all the 
Shinrin Roku research coming out of Japan showing that that really affects our immune system or inflammation. Totally. So that's key. Um, well, if there was just one exercise that you could, the, this would be the only exercise you could do for the rest of your life, like your favorite, what would it be and why? And we could, it could be a squat, it could be a deadlift, it could be walking, it could be skiing, just one thing that you feel is really powerful. I personally like push-ups, but not everybody can do that. Um, it has to be walking. Yeah. It has to be walking. Virtually anybody can get out and do that. And, and that's something that, you know, we didn't have gyms at the quantity that we have now 100 years ago. People walked everywhere. They biked everywhere. And, you know, walking is so simple. It connects you with the earth, though. You know, and if you can walk barefooted, great. Mm -hmm. not, not, not on the sidewalk, not on the roads, but, you know, on grass. Um, that is the simplest and I would say the most profound thing that people can do that I still think we get away from. Yeah. Um, you know, gosh, I would love it if people could get out there and get a sweat on, get their heart rate up, and do some vigorous activity uh, in various forms. For me, I love to do push-ups. I love to run. Uh, but that's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. But walking, there's no reason that most of us who are physically capable of doing that can't be doing that daily. Yeah. Since getting a Fitbit about six months ago, I've realized it's very easy to get 15, 20,000 yeah. if you make the intentional effort to walk to work and take that step and, yeah. and do all that. And that makes it key. Yeah, it's a key impact on health. Um, Okay, so we talked about favorite exercise, morning routine. What's a, an herb nutrient botanical? Just something that you frequently recommend your, that your clients take and that you personally couldn't live without? Turmeric. So curcumin specifically mm -hmm. is the extract of turmeric. But if you had, you know, again, if you don't have access to supplements, that's fine. You know, get turmeric, get the spice. It's very inexpensive. Cook yeah. with it. Bring it into your, your regime daily. Um, there are many recipes and online strategies to help your body absorb natural spice. We've got to always look at nature like you know yes i'm a naturopathic doctor but we've got to use this logically as well mm -hmm. supplements are helpful but it doesn't replace eating real food and we've got to always start with that and i think sometimes we get away from that totally turmeric is my favorite i love it it's unfortunately out of season right now i've had a hard time getting it but i think once yeah. winter comes around that's when it comes back in i believe yeah. so the fall is the only time of year um, so yeah, t cooking with it, and research is showing that the turmeric uh, polyphenols and essential oils imp improve uh, vegetable diversity, and we talked about the gut and so forth. So it's not just about absorption, there's a, a huge gut effect as well. It's massive. It's yeah. key. So final question here, Dr. Dempster, if you were in an eleva elevator with a parliament member, a politician of sorts, and they said, hey doc, you know, I'm about to go into a meeting that you know, we're going to uh, talk about improving the health of our community and, and, and my, uh, my constituency, what lifestyle or health tip would you want them to know that they can maybe influence some policy around and really help the masses? Well, I think it starts with, again, food. I think that's food and activity are things that we can start to, you know, I'm, I'm not involved with government, but I literally just had a meeting with my MP last week, interestingly enough. Um, and I would say, look, if we can cut sugar out, you know, that's one thing. If, we, if there can be some policy that reduces the sugar that's going into our children at school, um, you know, again, I don't know how that looks, but if there's a way that we could reduce the impact of refined sugars in our, in our lifestyle, that's, I would say, pretty ubiquitous right now. Yeah. I think that we're not only going to see a tremendous shift in health overall, but the government is probably going to end up saving a lot of money on health care down the road, which is, unfortunately, sometimes the motivating factor there. Yeah. So I think if we ever needed to do one thing, it would be to somehow find a way to really restrict those uh, refined sugars going into our foods. Yeah, that's key. You know, it's in seemingly healthy foods now. I was looking at coconut chips, toasted coconut chips. The brand is Bear. Sorry if you're affiliated with them. But I couldn't find any coconut chips without added cane sugar. Like it's that's all these healthy foods. Yeah. So you go to the healthy section and in, a lot of people are not trained to read labels like we are as practitioners yep. and so forth. And they see organic, non-GMO they pick it off and don't realize that it's 15 grams of sugar per serving. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a great policy. Dr. Dempster, really appreciate you coming yeah, on you the bet, show. Mike. Yeah, this great to see you. a lot of fun. Yeah, like um, as we'll see on the ski hills. Absolutely. We've got to do that sometime this winter for sure. So if folks want to connect with you, what's your personal website? If we get on our website, is thedempsterclinic.com, www.thedempsterclinic.com. Awesome. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you want to check out uh, the links and information that we talked about, like the Mental Wellness Tribe and the Summit, please click the link below this video. And if you liked it, please subscribe and give it a thumbs up.